Jobs and Economic Growth Committee to order. Today is February 27th, 2017, and uh, we do have a quorum present. First bill on the agenda, Senate File 758, Senator Ingebrigtsen. <laughs> Senator, welcome to the Jobs Committee. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Glad to be here. Senate File 758 before you is the Getting to Work Grant Pilot Program appropriation. We've got a couple of comments, and then, as you can see, I have a couple of testifiers, and I know you have a busy schedule, so I'll move as quickly as I can here. This is nothing, this is nothing new uh, to the state of Minnesota. We've had this program going on, and it seems to be growing, and, and in rural Minnesota especially, the need is there. Uh, the goal is of uh, Senate File 758 the getting to work bill is made is to make sure that Minnesotans have the transportation they need to get, get and keep their jobs. In greater Minnesota, for most people, this means having a reliable personal vehicle. And it's not, an, it's not an easy task in some areas because they have a long ways to drive. Uh, I remember uh, talking with, with folks out there uh, over the recent last couple of years where they've had 30 miles one way to drive to keep their job. And, and uh, where, where we can help people like that out, uh, uh, we should be certainly looking at this, and this bill does address that. Senate File 758 provides funding for nonprofit organizations that allow low interest auto loans or leases, affordable car repairs, or donated vehicles to families who need a car to get to work. These programs are an important resource for individuals who don't have any other way to get to work if their car breaks down. I have testifiers who would like to speak in support of the bill. Anna Odegaard is the legislative advocate for the Minnesota Asset Building Coalition. <clears throat> then we have uh, several other members that would like to talk, and I think they're on your list. So uh, with that, Mr. Chair, if I could turn it over to, uh, to uh, Ms. Odegaard. Ms. Odegaard, welcome to the Senate Jobs Committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. My name is Anna Odegaard, and I'm the legislative advocate for the Minnesota Asset Building Coalition. We are a coalition of 140 nonprofit organizations statewide that are committed to helping lower income families achieve financial stability by building assets. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of Senate File 758, the Getting to Work Bill, and thanks especially to Senator Ingebrigtsen uh, for authoring the bill, and to our co-author on this committee, Senator Paul Anderson. We all know that workers without a vehicle are at a significant disadvantage in the job market, especially in areas of the state without public tra transportation, or if they work second or third shift or need to take a child to childcare on their way to work. As Senator Ingebrigtsen said, Senate File 758 provides funding through a competitive grant pro uh, program administered by DEED to nonprofit organizations that offer low interest auto loans, affordable car repairs, or donated vehicles to families who need a car to get to work. Most of you probably know there are a handful of fantastic programs around the state already doing this work. These programs partner with auto dealerships, auto service providers, banks and credit unions, churches and civic organizations that want to invest in their communities and that believe that when someone has a will to work, there needs to be a way to get there. The purpose of this bill is to expand successful programs and launch new ones in parts of the state where they can make a real difference. I'd like to highlight just a couple of sections on the bill. Subdivision 3 defines the program requirements. In addition to providing those vehicles or vehicle repairs, eligible programs need to offer an educational component such as budgeting for car ownership or instruction on vehicle maintenance and repair. Subdivision 4 requires organizations applying for funding to have a plan for leveraging resources from their community. And I'm excited for you to hear in just a moment from Jim Huff about how his program partners with their community to help their neighbors get to work. Subdivision 5 includes the eligibility criteria for participants, including income guidelines, also a requirement that participants have a valid driver's license and proof of insurance, and they demonstrate that they need that vehicle to obtain or maintain employment. And last, Subdivision 7 requires DEED to evaluate programs that receive funding and report to you on the outcomes. The last thing I'd like to draw your attention to is a county-by-county county map of the state of Minnesota that's in your packets. It looks like this. I hope you got it in color. Altogether, the existing vehicle programs are able to serve 33 counties in Minnesota. And last year, they were able to get or keep over 1,000 families on the road. But most of those programs have long waiting lists. And the gray area on the map shows the 54 counties where you can't even get on a waiting list because none of these programs exist. 
The $1 million appropriation we're asking for in this bill could launch six programs that could provide a total of 240 vehicles and 2,300 vehicle repairs to members of the community who need a car to get to work. I want to thank the Minnesota Auto Dealers Association, the Minnesota Bankers Association, the Minnesota Credit Union Network, and the Alliance of Automotive Service Providers of Minnesota for the great work that their members do in partnership with vehicle programs around the state. Please take a look at their letter of support in your packet. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify. I'm very pleased to turn it over to Jim Huff, the director of a nonprofit vehicle program called Cars for Neighbors. Mr. Huff, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I'm Jim Huff, the Executive Director of Cars for Neighbors. For over 17 years, Cars for Neighbors has provided free or low-cost car repair as well as car donations to lower-income residents of Anoka County. Over our 17 years, we have helped with over 3,600 car repairs, and recently we donated the 998th car. So you can imagine we're excited to get to 1,000 here very shortly. In addition to car repairs and donations, we provide education and budgeting, uh, or education about budgeting and car maintenance. We achieve this through a small organizational structure with many strong and critical and numerous volunteers. Uh, so as an example, we have 10 shops that will repair cars uh, to get them ready for donation free of charge of labor. We have two part suppliers that provide our parts to us at cost. And we have many people who have volunteered, some for over a decade, at our car care clinics. And our primary repair shop has cut their or decreased their normal labor rate by half in order to help us leverage our resources. And we do receive strong support from the civic, faith, and business communities of Anoka County. We pull this network together to help families become more self-sufficient, one car at a time, one family at a time. Our core mission is getting people to work by, by providing safe, reliable, personal transportation. Geographically, Anoka County is very large. So depending on where someone lives, where they work, and even what shift they work on, often depend, will determine whether they will be able to use public transportation. About 80% of the people we serve are single parents. So in addition to getting to work, there's often a stop at daycare or school, both on the way to work and on the way back. We have had clients that we've served tell us that prior to receiving a donated car, they were spending as much as four hours a day on the bus. Of course, this is time away from their children. And although uh, keeping people employed is our core mission, we know that when someone has personal transportation, it opens up opportunities to fully participate in their communities. Having families that are mobile create vibrant communities where they can get to work or have access to health care and a means to get their children to school and community activities. So for us, a car is not a luxury, but rather a means to engage fully in one's community. I thank you for your time and your kind attention. Donna. I would like to then introduce um, Donna Hunt, who is uh, on our board of directors and also will be telling her personal story uh, about Cars for Neighbors. Thank you. Ms. Hunt, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Hello, members of the committee. My name is Donna Hunt. I am a long-term resident of Anoka County and work with the elderly and disabled. I have two children, Michelle, 27, who's recently engaged, and Jake, 25, who has cerebral palsy and nonverbal learning disability. In 2012, I finally got the courage to leave a 16-year domestic violence marriage. At the time, I had just started working at the county, and I was struggling. My daughter had moved out, and my son, Jake, still with me, had many appointments at Gillette Children's Hospital. I was driving a van that looked good on the inside and the outside, but had many mechanical issues. Only one window worked. It was always overheating, so we had to drive with the heat on, which definitely wasn't fun on those hot days. All four tires had slow leaks in them, so every morning before work, I would walk around to see which tires I needed to top off before I went anywhere. The transmission often would stick in second gear, and the back brakes were pretty much non-existent. I was constantly in fear of my car breaking down, and what would that mean? Would I have to go back to an unhealthy situation? Would I lose my job? And how would I get Jake to his appointments at Gillette Children's Hospital? 
I reluctantly applied for a program called Cars for Neighbors, thinking it was a long shot. To my surprise, I got a call the very next day explaining the program, asking for required documentation they needed, and I was told I needed to attend a car care Saturday. It was incredibly nice to have people care about my situation and treat me with respect. I attended the car care Saturday where I learned about general maintenance on cars and took a budgeting class. I couldn't believe my eyes when the director took me over to this wonderful little Saturn and he was handing me the keys to it. I immediately started crying and couldn't stop. And he said, I cannot give you keys if you can't stop crying because it's not safe for you to drive. <laughs> so here I was, broken, depleted, and trying my very best to support my son and I. And this organization cared enough to help me get the one thing I really needed, a reliable car. So you may be sitting there thinking, that's nice, they gave you a car. But what you need to understand is that this vehicle bridged the gap between despair and hope. Within weeks of this, my dad had a massive heart attack, and because I now had reliable transportation, I was able to go be with him in Illinois and help set care up for him. Approximately two months later, I walked into work and realized it was the first time I hadn't walked around my new car looking at the tires out of habit. Once the constant worry of reliable transportation left me, my mindset changed and I could dream a little and think about my future. I signed back up for college and was able to drive to Metro State University to work on my bachelor's degree. So this isn't just a car. It bridged the gap between despair and hope. It has provided me safety, security, and also sustainability in my career and future opportunities. So much that I am now honored to serve as a board member for Cars for Neighbors and 18 months ago, I was promoted to a higher paying job serving our community members in Anoka County. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Ms. Hunt, for your testimony. Um, next, we have uh, Mr. Peterson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, my name is Bradley Peterson. I'm here today on behalf of the Coalition of Greater Minnesota Cities and happy to support our partners in the newly launched Rural Equity Project, uh, MABC and others. Um, here today on uh, Senator Ingebrigtsen's bill. One of the great privileges of my job is that I get to drive around this great state of ours and meet with local elected officials who represent cities large and small around greater Minnesota. Um, it's honestly the best part of my job. Um, I was taken aback a couple of summers ago when I'm sitting in the back of a uh, restaurant in the city of Bagley uh, in northwest Minnesota talking to the mayor. And one of the things that I like to do is I ask these local officials, what are the greatest challenges that are facing your community? And the mayor, without missing a beat, said transportation. And so I thought, okay, roads and bridges. And so I started asking about that. And he's like, no, no, no. The challenge that my people have is that a lot of them don't have reliable vehicles to get them to work. I was floored that this was the thing that was top of mind for a community leader in one of our cities. And he went on to tell the story that many of you know very well of his residents and citizens who uh, may work 30 to 40 miles away uh, in a different town or may have to commute 30 to 40 miles to get to Bagley to do their job, and that the most important asset in their lives was a reliable vehicle. And so I can tell you since then, I've talked to many elected officials for whom this has been a concern. And I know that uh, Mayor Carlson, the mayor of Alexandria, is a big uh, supporter of their vehicle program uh, in that community um, and can testify to the power of change that it's made uh, for people that she knows. And so, Mr. Chair, um, just really appreciate the opportunity to be here to uh, lend our voice uh, in support of this effort uh, and do hope that as you uh, are assembling uh, your budget uh, that you're able to find some room in your budget for this modest request. Mr. Peterson, thank you for your testimony. Members, any questions for any of our testifiers this afternoon on Senate File 758? Seeing none, Senator Ingebrigtsen, any final comments? Um, no, uh, 
Not really, uh, Mr. Chair. Just uh, I, I think it's pretty, pretty compelling what rural Minnesota, the challenges they have out there, and as evidenced by the uh, uh, lady sitting next to me, uh, I've, I've heard a lot of those stories, and I'm sure some of you have as well. And uh, I, you know, I think it, you know, the, the amount of people that are volunteering and that are helping out with repairing cars, and, and they just take them in, they just take them into their shops, and. And uh, with a little bit of assistance from the state, we can keep an awful lot of people going forward uh, uh, with their families. So appreciate the uh, appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you for bringing this issue forward. Uh, with no other testimonies, everyone else in the audience, I would uh, like to testify on Senate File 758. See none and no further discussion. Senate File 758 will be laid over for possible inclusion in the Jobs and Economic Growth Omnibus Bill. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, members, next we have Senate File 980, Senator Westrom. And we have two broadband bills, and uh, Senator Simonson, if, it's, uh, if it works for you, we'll, uh, we'll go through Senator Westrom's first. Um, and I know he's gotten at least an author's amendment, and there may be some others. And then after we uh, take care of his bill, then we'll bring you up, and then we'll do the testimony after that. Very good. Senator Westrom, uh, welcome to the Senate Jobs Committee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, committee members. Mr. Chair, um, I have an author's amendment, and I'm wondering just for the sake of describing it, if, if it makes sense to just put that on the bill and then I can present the bill as, as, uh, as amended. Um, it was a tweak and oversight on my part of uh, not putting a provision in that I had intended to at least put in for discussion. Sure. So uh, Senator Westrom has the A2 amendment. Uh, Senator Utke will, uh, will move the A2 amendment. This is the first committee, so this is an author's amendment. Uh, all those in favor of the author's amendment, please say aye. 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 Opposed? I can't vote. Motion carries. <laughs> Senator Westrom. Well, Mr. Chair, um, in, in what the amendment does, and members, what I'd like to uh, have in for the discussion is uh, uh, dealing with the uh, challenge or the appeal process that's currently in place, and uh, it, it just doesn't subject these dollars to that appeal process. Uh, that was how I originally had intended to draft the bill, and so I appreciate you at least putting that on so we present the bill. Uh, that's, that's what I wanted to start with from a discussion standpoint. Uh, okay, get into uh, the Senator Westrom, before you proceed, Senator Isaacson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Are we doing the A1? Is that right? Uh, Senator Isaacson, we, we did the A2 was the author's amendment. And then we'll be doing the A1? Uh, let's see here, A1. Okay, so we have not done the A1 yet, Senator Isaacson. Um, I'm sorry, Mr. I thought we were on the A1 to first to start with. That's why I wanted to clarify. Yep, so okay. uh, council, can you please explain what the A1 amendment is? Well, Mr. Chair, do, is somebody moving the, a, the A1 that well, is was this, in the packet? Is this an author's amendment? No, it's or? not. Well, uh, not that I'm aware of, Mr. The, Chair. Uh, Mr. Chair, members, I drafted the A2 after I drafted the A1, that's the only reason that it's the A2 that's the author's amendment. It just it goes sequentially. But the A1 is in, in the packet. No one has moved it. It's just in the packet at this point. Okay. So, Senator Westrom, okay. uh, to your bill. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, uh, this, uh, this bill is to uh, help uh, continue uh, pursuing and uh, helping uh, rural broadband build out across uh, corners of our state that are uh, either uh, very much underserved or don't have a high-speed internet. Uh, the state has had a grant program that has generally worked fairly well for a few years, and we found a lot of areas being benefited, especially in rural and deep rural Minnesota. There are simply places, uh, like uh, 75 years ago when electricity came through this country, that rural and deep rural places didn't have electricity, and it was hard to make a business case that uh, the private sector alone would be able to build out to these areas without uh, enormous rates, uh, different than most of the other customers, or it just wouldn't happen because they couldn't make a business case to, 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 uh, to afford it or justify it or recover their costs for investment. 
So we have a uh, program in the state of Minnesota that does a 50% match, uh, up to 50% match of state dollars in certain areas that are unserved or underserved. What this bill does is continues uh, that, the spirit of that to help out the rural areas that are uh, being left behind by the digital age and the digital economy and high-speed internet. But this would allocate $35 million, and in doing that, Mr. Chair and uh, committee members, the unserved areas seem to be harder to uh, get built out right now, and I've got areas in my district that continue to uh, not uh, get built out, or it's hard to make the case that, that areas in uh, rural Traverse County, for example, uh, or uh, western Grant County around the city of Herman, Minnesota, uh, aren't uh, experiencing or en enjoying the high-speed internet that many of us do, even in smaller towns in rural Minnesota that do have high-speed internet. So what this would do in, in, in uh, short is it would take 30 of the 35 million and target it towards the unserved areas. Unserved is defined in statute. And it would allow up to a 75% grant in those areas that are even harder to serve. Uh, many have said uh, in order to build these out, you're gonna probably have to have a, a, some additional dollars or grant dollars. Secondly, it would allow up to $5 million to be used for the underserved areas to help continue building those places out that, that are barely on the edge of, of high-speed internet but, but do have some in existence. And um, Mr. Chair, uh, members, this would also uh, change the requirement that currently in, sta in statute uh, for the broadband grants, uh, we approved last year the, un the, the last mile not to be subject to prevailing wage. About two years or two or three years ago when these, these grants first went out, uh, the first year, the response by just about every agency or entity that, that was using the grants noted one thing, that the prevailing wage laws in the state of Minnesota were driving up the cost of these grants by about 25% or more. Uh, Big Stone County was one of the first big projects in the state. It happens to be in my district. The county commissioners have came to me at, at meetings <coughs> and said our project costs went from $3.2 million to $4 million on the same project because we had to subject it to the prevailing wage laws. They would rather that we just let the, let the entities that are putting in broadband now go for the best bid and assist them with dollars, and we could stretch these dollars for the rural broadband grants much further if we let the private market continue building out like they currently will and just simply be an assistance for those uh, areas that are hard to serve and uh, without some additional dollars aren't, aren't going to uh, get some rural broadband uh, deployed or built. And so with that, Mr. Chair, that's kind of an overview of the whole um, bill. I guess lastly, just the amendment that we added was the appeal process that uh, was put in place last year. I've had several come to me and raise concerns that the process allows uh, the current providers to knock out uh, their, their proposals, and they don't feel it's fair. And uh, Mr. Chair, I offer that uh, to have us uh, look at that for a discussion purpose. Uh, I do think there could be some merit to the appeal or challenge process, but I think there also ought to be equal penalty if somebody is challenging to knock out the competition and then there's not sufficient uh, evidence that they're going to move quickly to, to build out that area or uh, there should be a penalty if they knock out the, the, the grant uh, applicant and then don't build out that area because it, it merely puts people at least three years further behind if something doesn't get built in that area because they can knock it out for this process and 18 months thereafter that really eliminates them for the next two s cycles as well. So that's what the amendment would do. I'm happy to uh, answer any questions or continue to work with you and other interest groups in trying to advance rural broadband grants. Well, thank you, Senator Westrom. And I know there are a number of people that are gonna testify. Uh, we have Senator Simonson's uh, Senate file 235 as well. Um, that's, the, that's the broadband grant. That's the um, a recommendation from the uh, broadband group. Um, is there anyone in the audience that would like to testify specifically on the portions of the bill that are in Senator Westrom's 
bill, and then we will open it up to uh, discussion. I already have Senator Goggin on the list. Um, and uh, so with that, anyone who'd like to testify on Senate file 980. Mr. Hansen, welcome to the committee. Uh, please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Adam Hansen. I'm with the Associated Builders and Contractors of Minnesota. ABC represents over 300 merit shop construction companies throughout the state who employ over 20,000 high-skilled, high-quality, multi-skilled craft professionals. These contractors and the men and women that they employ represent and are a part of the 65% of construction workers that choose not to belong to a union. <coughs> ABC supports Senate File 980 without any other amendments besides the author's amendment. As some of you have no doubt heard from your constituents and are about to hear today, the lack of high quality and the lack of access to broadband in greater Minnesota is making economic growth and expansion difficult for many communities, families, and businesses. ABC supports exempting border-to-border -border broadband grant program dollars from the state's outdated and costly prevailing wage mandates. <coughs> A study done by the Independent Minnesota Taxpayers Association found that the state's prevailing wage laws on average increase the cost of taxpayer funding construction projects by 10%. The impact of costly prevailing wage mandates hits even harder in greater Minnesota, the very place where these broadband grant dollars are slated to go. Looking at Deed's Occupational Employment Statistics Survey in a study done by the Minnesota Center for Fiscal Excellence found that over half of greater Minnesota's prevailing wage rates in construction were 20% higher than Deed's OES median wages reported for the same labor class broken down by county. Another area of concern when prevailing wage mandates on a project in greater Minnesota is the problem of imported wages from counties outside of the county where the dollars are going to. Often that's usually a union, union rate, wage rate from the seven county metro. Such rate importing occurs in cases where criteria, criteria for setting prevailing wage rates for a particular labor class in a county are not met, so then the Department of Labor and um, Industry imports the wage from an adjacent county. In that same study, 45% of prevailing wage rates in the labor class for a county were imported in that manner. We let the market decide how much broadband and cell phone companies can charge for their products, even though they are the beneficiaries of this broadband dollar or grant program. So why then are we mandating a one-size-fits-a-few man prevailing wage law that apply to these funds? ABC and the tens of thousands of construction and craft professionals who choose not to join a union are disappointed that prevailing wage exemption is potentially, well, hasn't been removed yet, excuse me. With limited resources in cities and counties, along with finite amount of grant dollars from the state, exempting critical broadband infrastructure projects from the outdated prevailing wage mandates is the right thing to do for Greater Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hansen. Uh, Mr. Dorman, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Dan Dorman. I'm the Executive Director of the Greater Minnesota Partnership. Uh, I want to testify, uh, Mr. Chair and members, on the uh, A2 amendment. Uh, you, you can have a robust discussion about the dollar level that you want to put into the fund whether it's the amount called for in this bill, the amount called for in Representative Simonson's bill, the $60 million that the governor's calling for, but they all need this amendment attached to them, and, and, and here's why. This is the, the uh, language added last year to the challenge process is very anti-competitive. So for those of you who believe in power of the free market, the power of competition, you really should uh, support the, uh, the Western Amendment. The, the, the idea is that somehow there's these incumbent providers out there that were about to make this investment, and all of a sudden here comes this outsider you know, sneaking in under the cover of darkness and, and uh, taking their territory is, is really not how it works. Uh, if you think about a, a community in, in greater Minnesota or the metro area that has poor internet service, Somebody, usually the Chamber of Commerce, the city, somebody's going to organize a meeting, right? And we're going to start talking about this, and the public's going to be aware of it, and the newspaper's going to be there. And if there's an incumbent provider that was about to invest capital dollars over the next couple of years, they'd likely drop by that meeting and say, hey, folks, you don't need to do this because we're going to do it, right? That is what happens in the real world. The, what this does is it, 
it, it, it prevents somebody from coming in and saying, hey, I think I can serve this better than that incumbent provider. The incumbent provider bounces them out. Uh, okay, they may, they may come back in a couple of years if the incumbent provider doesn't do what they've promised to do. Or what also might be likely to happen, though, is they're not likely to ever reapply again. Why would you spend the money to put an application together to go apply for a grant, get a grant, and serve an area only to have your application and your, your money kicked out? So I think that, that there's some other changes that I'd recommend you make, but this is a, this is a critical one. And without it, uh, I think we're really uh, uh, hurting and, and impacting the effectiveness of of the grant program. I would encourage you before, uh, Mr. Chair, before you button up your, your final bill, really try to understand what the uh, implications were. We've only had one year of it, but we, I, I know there were some uh, successful uh, challenges, some projects that were put on hold. I, I don't think that's the direction that, that we want to go in. I think that the more we can encourage competition in this area is, is better. So that, that's my testimony on, on uh, that amendment, Mr. Chair. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you for your testimony. Members, any questions for Mr. Hansen or Mr. Dorman? Senator Goggin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, uh, I'd like to move that we uh, take up Amendment A-1. Okay. Before we take up the A-1 amendment, uh, Senator Goggin, I just want to ask if there's any other folks that would like to testify specifically on Senate File 980 at this time. Okay. Seeing none. Okay. Senator Goggin has the A-1 amendment. Uh, it should be in members' packets, and uh, Senator Isaacson, I apologize, this is where the confusion was. This amendment was uh, drafted uh, before the A-2 was uh, at Senator Goggin's request. Uh, Senator Goggin, you want to explain the amendment? It is in everyone's packet. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> what this amendment does is it deletes um, Section 2, which is lines 1.12 uh, through 1.18, uh, basically strikes out the uh, uh, exemption of the prevailing wage. Okay, Senator Goggin, and just uh, so I understand correctly, um, you your intention is not to undo the work that's been that was done last year, as far as the last mile, uh, those types of things, as far as prevailing wage. You're just striking it from this language in this bill, which means current law would uh, would proceed as is. Is that correct? Mr. Chair, that's correct. In Senate Council, um, is that how uh, the amendment is drafted, just so everyone's on the same page? Yes, Mr. Chair, if we, j if we get rid of um, Section 2, the, the new language that it was underlined would not go further along with this bill, and the current law that exempts that last mile infrastructure um, exemption for prevailing wage would stay in current law. Very good. Thank you. Members, any discussion on the A-1 amendment? Senator Little. Uh, Chair, I guess um, in reading the amendment, it does say page one, delete section two. I mean, section yep. two does cover 112 to 118. I guess I'm a little confused. So the way I read it in Senate Council, you can correct me, correct me if I'm wrong, but we're just striking it from the proposed bill, which means current law would prevail because there would be no changes to current law. Uh, but Senate Council, please correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, that's correct, uh, Mr. Chair. And it is kind of confusing. If we wanted to completely get rid of this uh, broadband prevailing wage exem exemption for last mile infrastructure, we would have to include in a repealer. We do have to repeal 116J.398, which is the current law. And just getting rid of this section just means that new language that was going to be amended onto the current language is no longer in play. It's not included in the bill anymore. Otherwise, we'd have to have a repealer to get rid of the entire law. Senator Westrom, uh, any comments on the A-1? Well, um, Mr. Chair um, and members, uh, I, would, I would ask you to consider not removing this provision. And uh, if we want to uh, change uh, how we calculate the prevailing wage in the rural grant program uh, or do something else, I'm certainly open to those discussions. But uh, Mr. Chair, uh, members, uh, as, as I stated, and you heard Mr. Hansen talk about 10 to 20 percent difference. Uh, my providers, uh, through and through, have told me their their, their estimates have gone up generally at least 25 percent uh, just to meet the prevailing wage requirement. 
Uh, these are the same companies that are plowing in internet, uh, updating in their current service territories, uh, putting out an estimate and uh, getting back multiple bids and going with the best uh, lowest bid. Uh, they're doing the exact same process, whether they have 50% or some percentage of state tax dollars uh, supplementing the cost of that project or not. Uh, the difference is if they've got a 20, uh, got to uh, raise the bids 25% more uh, because to comply with prevailing wage laws, which don't represent the wages they're getting estimates from in the private sector, it means the dollars we have for rural broadband grants just go less, uh, build, build less rural broadband. Uh, on a $10 million proposal uh, of dollars we put in, uh, nearly 2.5 million of that doesn't go to building more broadband, it would go to the higher cost bids that, that we're artificially uh, making happen because of the current law. Now, admittedly, the last mile change from last year would lower that 25% to some other percentage, but the reason I would ask you to consider keeping it in is the goal is to help build out the unserved and the rural areas that don't have broadband. And uh, this is a, an expense from the state uh, that's mandated on our internet providers or the entities that build out. In some cases, it's a local group of people or a local unit of government. And why not stretch these dollars as far as we possibly can? But that's the best interest of the taxpayer. And we've got a clear example on the estimates that our broadband providers, uh, when they go forward with these projects, are, are uh, getting. Now, uh, another project uh, that happened in my district a couple of years ago, it was a $600,000 project if they did it uh, themselves, the, 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 the phone company. They didn't do it because it was, wasn't cost effective. When they rebid that $600,000 project under the grant, they saw the cost go up to $800,000. They had to put in 50% of that. So instead of putting in 600,000 before, which didn't, didn't uh, make a business case, they had to put 400,000 in, which made it more viable. But that same project that would have cost $600,000 before getting the grant <coughs> for the company cost them 400,000, and yet they got 50% of the, of the project paid for, but the project was now $800,000. So instead of only having to put $300,000 in and having another 100,000 to build out other broadband, they had to pay $400,000 into that same project because of the prevailing wage laws. And that's the reason I'm suggesting we review this and give rural broadband dollars the best use for the taxpayers and build up the most broadband we possibly can across rural Minnesota. All right, Senator Simonson. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, I've got some, some concerns with the underlying bill, but I want to thank Senator Goggin for bringing this amendment forward. I think it's a good amendment. I think we should support the A1. Um, if there's one thing I've learned about prevailing wage issues is that it's incredibly complicated. There are a lot of moving parts and a lot of interested parties. And I think uh, to simply just you know waive that uh, as we proceed forward and you consider this bill in your omnibus bill, I think would be uh, unwise at best. So I would support the A1 amendment. All right, Senator Utke. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I guess I would just speak in opposition to a the A1. I think when we're out uh, trying to extend broadband as far as we can into the underserved uh, areas of our state, uh, we need to get the most bang for our buck. Uh, the people are not working for any less than they would be working on any other project. It's, it's, it's good work. They want it. And, uh, you know, it's a way to get that many more people served. So. I would uh, not support A1. All right, members, uh, Senator Goggin moves the A1 amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. A1 is adopted. Uh, any further discussion on Senate File 980? I have one question, Mr. Chair. Senator Champion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Senator Westrom, I'm looking at line 2.6. Uh, where it says of this appropriation, no more than five million may be used for grants to underserved areas. Uh, can you tell me why uh, you have talked a lot about underserved areas and the uh, the rural areas being underserved? 
but I guess there is the conclusion of underserved, and I just want to understand why you were, were only uh, uh, making sure that no more than $5 million can be used in those areas. And uh, Senator Westrom, before you proceed, I believe that was the how the language was written in last year's bill, uh, Senator Champion, um, with the same dollar amount, but Senator Westrom. Mr. Chair and, and, and uh, Senator Champion, uh, thanks for the question. Uh, and certainly that's up for discussion, but the difference is, and, and, and I'll ask Senate Council, maybe they can, they can refer us to the actual definition of underserved versus unserved. And there's two different thresholds, Senator Champion. Underserved doesn't mean that you don't have high-speed internet. Underserved means you don't have the new level of high-speed internet that the FCC or, or uh, uh, agencies are recommending uh, be, be, be uh, uh, that, that you're at for, for a level of, of service. And so it's, I think it's like 20 gig or, or some number, but I'll ask uh, Ms. Fontaine to maybe uh, add to that. But so the, the, the idea under this bill is there's only so many dollars a state can put into these programs every couple of years. And the unserved areas are still not being uh, built uh, out because the dollars go to the underserved areas, which uh, many people in unserved areas would love to have something more than just dial-up or uh, very minimal speeds that, that they can't get any faster. Uh, I've got, I was in town meetings the last two weekends. Uh, city of Wheaton, uh, there's a, uh, a, a home-based business lady that was at the meeting. And even in the city of Wheaton, she said, uh, she, for her job, she had a 28-page attachment, and they've got high-speed internet. Uh, but she had to send that attachment in 28 separate emails, one page at a time, in order to get it to go through. Uh, three miles out of town, uh, people don't even have uh, high-speed internet that they can reasonably rely on, just outside of the, the town of Wheaton, for example. So that's what we're trying to get at, is getting those... Uh, unserved areas, uh, Senator Champion, that are uh, dial-up or, or very, very uh, antiquated uh, high-speed internet speeds uh, up to a higher level, and uh, that's, that's why it's targeting 30 million towards those unserved. Thir Five million would still be able to go to the underserved. Senator Champion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Westrom, for your explanation. Uh, but it just would appear to me that if you are concerned about that area of the state receiving broadband or having access to broadband, that that would mean all of them, and that you wouldn't just say only a limited portion of the resources can be used for the underserved, while the unserved gets access to 30 million. It, 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 would, it would appear to me that they would all be on equal footing, because you are, con you are concerned about the region and the area. And so I have yet to hear you tell me why there was the, the distinction in the resources for the underserved versus the unserved when it comes to the appropriation in this bill. And that's what I was looking for. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. And Senator Champion, when we heard uh, testimony from uh, Department of Employment and Economic Development, the broadband office, uh, they did explain a little bit, but that is, that's how the language was last year as well. Uh, that five million for um, underserved areas. So the the priority is on the unserved areas, and I think I uh, uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, represented from the department. But I believe uh, the grants came in even lower than that amount because uh, not as many grants came in for the underserved area. But we can uh, talk more about that uh, uh, when we have uh, further testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, any, uh, for Senator Simonson. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Westrom, for bringing the bill forward. Uh, I think there's some, uh, some interesting points to your bill, and I don't necessarily disagree with some of them, uh, but, I, but I will say this, and as I said earlier when we talked about the amendment, um, I have found uh, over the last few years working on this issue that it is incredibly complicated, and there are a lot of varied interests in this arena of broadband development. And I think everybody agrees, or just about everybody agrees, even here in the legislature, that building out a border-to-border, -border adequate, good quality broadband service is high on the list of priorities of things to get done. 
you know, the question really comes to play is how, how do we do that? And I think, um, you know, there's a reason why my bill doesn't have any policy language in it. It's, it's because I don't want it to be complicated. Uh, and I don't want it to be uh, bogged down in details. I think it's important to remember, um, as the chair rightly pointed out, that we just went through a grant award process. Uh, and we have the numbers from that back here. And, I, and I'm just looking at the numbers that we received from Deed in one of our uh, committee hearings here, Mr. Chair, and, and it says pretty clearly that uh, there were 62 applications in the last round, 42 projects were awarded in regions all across Minnesota, uh, unserved locations, 18,370, and underserved locations of 568. So I, I do think that the policy is working, and I do think that we're reaching out to uh, areas of unserved Minnesota. Now. I think one of my goals, as, as I started this four years ago, is that we get to the point where we don't have to continue to uh, worry about the, the policy language in the grant appropriation process, and we don't have to worry about finding funds to put uh, as an appropriation. And by, me, by saying that, I mean that I hope we get to the point where we are done, uh, and, and, and Minnesota is connected border to border. Um, but, I, but I would just caution us as we move forward and you lay this bill over and consider about the policy is that there are pieces in here that were incredibly difficult to accomplish because you have a variety of interests coming together and that was uh, that was a lot of work and I think uh, as we move forward and we think about you know subsequent grant rounds we see how the challenge process continues to work we see where we're at in terms of, of providing in underserved and unserved areas and we come back, you know, maybe in a year or in the next biennium and, and see where we're at and then consider some policy changes. But I strongly encourage us that if we're going to consider uh, substantial policy changes such as within this bill, that we bring those interested parties together and, and figure out how to do that in the best interest of Minnesota. So I would, I would be a no on the bill. Senator Simonson, that's uh, a good segue into your bill. Uh, any further comments on Senate File 980 members of the committee? Uh, Senator Westrom, any further comments? Uh, Mr. Chair, no, not, not too much, just uh, I think it highlights the importance of rural broadband. Uh, I would just uh, urge us as we um, know that there's great demand and uh, a lot of the reason some of these unserved areas aren't built out is because they're sparsely populated. And uh, I'm disappointed with the change on the cost, but uh, we can certainly continue to discuss that. I would just urge us to find the best ways to, to match and stretch the tax dollars uh, in helping uh, more and more miles of broadband get built in our rural areas. And uh, uh, last, last thing I, I may have failed to mention, but it's not a big point, but uh, in looking at the last uh, grants that were approved, uh, the cap had been at $5 million. We have lowered the cap to $3 million to uh, help promote uh, uh, more projects, uh, maybe uh, uh, more people to apply, but the dollars to stretch a little further. And, uh, by and large, uh, I think there were only one or a couple projects that were over the three million cap, and so it seemed reasonable to uh, to set it at three million and stretch the dollars as far as we possibly can, because that's what's going to help rural broadband get built out. Thank you, All right. Senator Westrom. Thanks for bringing the bill forward. Uh, members, Senate File 980, as amended, will be laid over for possible inclusion in uh, the Jobs Omnibus Bill. Senator Simonson. Senate File 235. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I do think it's Senate File 234. 234. You're right, 234. The agenda says 235. Thank you for the correction, Senator Simonson. Senate File 234. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. And before I start, I just want to uh, say thank you to Senator Westrom. You know, he, he makes a lot of good points, and I think Ultimately, we're all trying to get to the same end goal. Um, it, it really just becomes a matter of how we get there. And today, uh, Mr. Chair, members, I just want to provide you a simple goal, a simple bill that really is just a, an appropriation. And the number itself is large in respect to $100 million. I understand that. But the $100 million figure did not come out of thin air. This is consistent with the recommendation of the Governor's Broadband Task Force 
which is not necessarily inconsistent with their recommendations in years past. And I am not suggesting to you that the legislature has always followed that recommendation. Um, we are looking to invest uh, very simply another $100 million into what has become really a highly successful border to border broadband grant program. Some of you will recall the legislator, legislature created this program in cooperation with Governor Dayton during the 2013 and 14 session. And I think it's really important to note that in total and to date that we have invested over $65 million into this program. Uh, that sounds like a lot of money, but keep in mind uh, as, you, as you think about this, the, the size of the need and the demand across greater Minnesota. These investments have helped extend quality connectivity to 10,000 homes, 1,000 businesses, and over 100 community anchor institutions all across greater Minnesota. There are a lot of really self-explanatory reasons for why Minnesotans want quality, dependable broadband service, whether it's in their homes for personal use, their businesses, schools, hospitals, resorts, or just about any other venue that you can imagine. I don't have to convince you that uh, adequate broadband is really the wave of the now and not necessarily the future. And again, this appropriation simply aligns with the recommendation of the task force, which is made up of uh, professionals in the broadband area, industry representatives, community representatives, and a whole host of people that are a lot smarter than, than any of us are on the broadband topic. Uh, so Mr. Chair, I, I know we don't have budget targets yet, but I just hope that you would consider uh, as large amount as you can afford, because I do think that investing in broadband across greater Minnesota really results in strong economic development and helping to keep some of our rural communities together. <coughs> and I know that there is um, a number of testifiers, so unless there's questions for me, I'll just get out of the way. Members, any questions for Senator Simonson? Okay, well, we'll start bringing up the testifiers. Uh, first, I have uh, Ms. Ziegler from the League of Minnesota Cities and Mayor Don. Uh, I'm gonna, you can, you can announce your last name so I don't, uh, so I don't get it incorrectly. And then we'll also bring up uh, Donna Martin as well. And uh, just please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Laura Ziegler. I'm here on behalf of the League of Minnesota Cities. We represent over 830 cities across the state. And I just wanna thank you, Mr. Chair, for hearing the broadband bills today, as well as Senators Westrom and Simonson for authoring and carrying the broadband funding bills this year. Uh, the League has a longstanding broadband policy, and it is, again, uh, one of our legislative uh, priorities. Before I introduce Mayor Bader here, I do want to mention that the League, along with 16 other organizations, uh, sent a letter to the Governor's Broadband Task Force last October that outlined um, some of the issues that Senator Westrom talked about with the challenge process. So I'd be more than happy to share that with the committee or uh, with other members as this moves along in the process. Uh, but just want to thank Senator Westrom for starting that conversation here today. Uh, from a city perspective, we really see this as an issue of equity as well as economic uh, development. And so we want to be here today to help keep this issue at the top um, when you're in uh, budget talks. And so by way of example already here today, you were talking about underserved versus unserved areas. And we've seen a lot of dialogue in this area over the years. And so we see it um, as balancing that equity of access as well as the economic development in cities. So a significant investment in this program helps with that balancing act. Unserved areas help to address the equity issue and getting broadband to every home, every farm, every business. And that underserved component can help with the economic development component. Uh, and underserved areas can also help stretch that dollar a little bit more because they can pair it with unserved areas and maybe get their return on investment um, a little bit quicker. So here to talk about the importance of getting broadband uh, to every home, but also what can follow economic development wise uh, within cities is the mayor of Gaylord, uh, Mayor Don Bader. Mr. Mayor, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Mr. Chair, committee members, I'm Don Bader, mayor of city of Gaylord, population of 2300, uh, about 70 miles west of here, very rural community. And some of you may have heard in the past couple of years the rumblings of maybe putting a medical college in that small community. 
Now, if you haven't, there's a lot of things that went into play in this. And to start out with, one thing is the development and construction of a new elementary school. In that, I put together a land swap deal where it made available the site for the elementary school in exchange for the current school, which the city would take in possession. That's just a small piece of it. The large piece of it is the RS Fiber project, high-speed broadband internet to our communities. This project consists of 10 cities, 17 townships that went together financially and $1 million from the state of Minnesota got the ro ball rolling on this project. This project now is in its final stages of this year, building out to the 10 cities, and next year we'll start with the 17 townships. In this process, one of the financial committee members that were going out seeking uh, financial assistance for this and uh, ended up in the state of New York and ran into a developer that develops osteopathic colleges in rural areas. In doing this, the broadband inter internet opened up the conversation of having high-speed internet in this small rural community and at the same time having a school building ready to renovate. So at this time, we're still in the process of getting this to become reality, but without the rural broadband internet, this would not have been a, a possibility whatsoever. So the rural broadband internet, in my opinion, is the best economic development tool that we can have for small rural communities. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Ms. Martin, please uh, state your name for the record and uh, proceed with your testimony. Mr. Chairman and members, um, good afternoon. My name is Donna Martin. I am the IT director for Polk County, P-O-P-E. <laughs> I always say that, not to confuse with Polk. And um, I'm here today to talk about our broadband experience. We, um, we have become a very determined county to change and to uh, bring broadband to uh, Pope County. We have had so many complaints. Um, our school system last year, our high school, actually um, deployed their uh, laptops to children from 5K through 12, or 5 through 12 um, students, and they found that 35% of them um, could go home, but they were in unserved or underserved areas and could not use their laptops. They had to um, bring in programs to come to school two hours early or stay two hours late, which became very um, difficult on the parents and their schedules and um, the learning ability. So we, we met with the schools and we've, um, back in July of 16, uh, Commissioner Larry Linder and Paul Jurdy and I formed a committee to see what we could do for Pope County. And where we've come to is um, we have applied for the Blandon Foundation grant, which we've received, and we will be starting our feasibility study now in March. We've met um, with 10, we have 10 telcos in our county, and we have actually met with five of them. And it, it's very disturbing where we have 10, but yet we uh, show 62% of our county is underserved. So we met with five telcos so far to see what their um, obligations are or how they'd like to partnership with Pope County, and we've had a great response. Uh, five of them are, have agreed to it, and one electrical um, company has also come forward for funding for them. So we are moving forward. We've done surveys. We've started on the feasibility study, and we are um, determined to bring broadband to Pope County. We have 5,333 um, residents in our county, and like I said, 62% of those are underserved. So we hope that our partnerships that we will um, form will bring this all together. So we are just really um, encouraging that we have the border-to-border -border grant so that we can apply for that and actually achieve our goals for education and EMS and for the residents of our county. Thank you. Ms. Martin, thank you for your testimony. Members, any questions? No? Okay. Uh, we'll bring up the next three testifiers on the list that I have. I have Mr. Van Hoosier, uh, Mr. Atwater, and Ms. Clough.
Good afternoon. Welcome to the Senate Jobs Committee. Uh, please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you. My name is Kevin. Kevin Van Hooser. I'm the uh, county administrator with Isanti County. Isanti County is, uh, uh, our county seat is Cambridge, Minnesota, just 47 miles north of here. Um, while we're not Traverse County, we certainly have uh, our challenges too. We've uh, our Economic Development Authority has uh, um, thought there was a lack of high-speed internet and they recommended uh, to our county board that we form a task force to um, uh, explore uh, the, the uh, situation. In Sandy County, well, we have, uh, have 38,000 um, um, residents. Half of those are still in the rural areas. Um, in the rural areas in Isani County is still still a lot of family farms, um, and what we're finding out is a lot of uh, small businesses. So in this task force that we formed, we're, uh, we've invited folks from the community to uh, give us some stories, tell us why why this is important. And so, so some of the things we've learned, speaking of the farming situation, last fall we had uh, somebody running for uh, for senator. He lost, but. Uh, he, was, he told a story about um, uh, driving into a, a driveway at a, at a farm and the farmer was up on a ladder that he had propped up on the silo and he waited for him to get down. He said, can I ask, what were you doing up there? And he was carrying his iPad. He said, this is the only, only place on the farm where I can get reception uh, for, for internet. So, but I've talked to somebody else, another farmer who says in a different part of the county, he has two computers going in his tractor cab at all times. So that talks about the disparity around Ice Sandy County. Um, small businesses, we've, we've, we've been hearing about many small businesses. This uh, uh, one uh, told, told our task force, he runs a small business out of his house or garage. He has to take his laptop into town to place orders or receive orders. Um, and, and another one, our hospital CEO uh, joined us. And well, in the city of Cambridge, if you live or work in the city of Cambridge, there's not a lot to complain about as far as high-speed internet. But our, the CEO of the hospital says, uh, said, Kevin, don't, it's, it's, it, that's not what we're worried about. We have future plans uh, for out, out in the rural areas. As a matter of fact, uh, I just tried to recruit a physician and when he found out that he couldn't uh, look at the x-rays and, and, uh, at home uh, where he wanted to live in the county, he chose not to accept our offer. So um, that makes it tough for uh, our rural hospital. And, and a more personal story, as far as the county goes, we have, uh, we have a judge, one of our judges lives on the northeast part of our county. And uh, when he takes his rotation to sign, uh, to sign warrants, he's not able to do it electronically, like all the other judges are. We, uh, our deputies have to get in their car and drive to the judge's house. So that takes, that cuts into our budget. So uh, through all these stories and the task force, uh, we, we have, and, and with the uh, planning grant from Blandon Foundation, um, the county board has decided to apply for, just like Donna was testifying, apply for the uh, grant uh, through Blandon Foundation to do a feasibility study. And the county, the county is committed. Uh, we're investing money for that matching grant and are looking forward uh, to what that feasibility study tells us. Uh, I think that's due on March 22nd, so we might be a few weeks behind Pope County, but we're looking forward to that feasibility study and uh, where we go from there. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, my name is Jason Atwater. I am the operations and product manager for Consolidated Telecommunications Company, CTC. We're located in Brainerd, Minnesota. CTC began servicing rural communities in 1950 with a farmer-owned telephone lines. The focus of CTC at that time, as it is today, is to provide advanced telecommunications services and solutions with the highest quality of services in the communities that we serve. 
CTC customers today have access to symmetrical gigabit services. So that is the same upload and download speeds, um, which is a major benefit and driver of a fiber optic infrastructures. CTC currently employs 62 full-time employees, along with another 50 contract laborers in the summer to perform our fiber to the home builds. CTC has deployed fiber to nearly 12,000 locations. Um, CTC has been awarded or is part of border to border broadband grants in all three rounds of funding. Our first two grants were for Fort Ripley and Fairview Townships, which are located in Crow Wing, Cass, and Morrison counties. Both projects have been successfully completed, with phase one being closed and completed. Phase two will be closed in the midsummer of 2017 with a higher success and take rate than originally projected. In this last round of grants, CTC will be working closely with Candy Ojai County and Mille Lacs Electric Cooperative to bring fiber to the home to unserved, underserved areas of Candy Ojai and Aiken counties. In June 2016, CTC hired a consultant to perform a broadband impact study from our first two Minnesota border to border grants for Fairview and Fort Ripley Townships. Um, I will highlight some key findings in the report and continue to justify, that continue to justify the need for border to border robust broadband in our state. Here's a few of the findings that we found. Half of the respondents own four or more personal computing devices and 70% have at least two smartphones in their homes. The older adult population surveyed is far more connected than older adult populations nationally. So our rural older adults were far more connected than a, a national poll. 14% of respondents are now teleworking. Over 20% of the respondents have a home-based business or farm. 36% reported that internet reduced their overall operating costs. 9% of these respondents plan to start a home-based business in one to three years. 30% are utilizing their internet connection for healthcare services. And 40% said they could not live in a home without reliable high-speed internet. We ask for continued support of Border to Border program, along with support of the Office of Broadband Development. The state of Minnesota no longer needs citizens being left behind without a robust broadband connection. CTC also supports a multi-year funding program. This would allow service providers to build a broader plans if there was funding available for multiple years. While 100 million is a large ask, CTC considers it to be a viable and needed number in a multi-year program. Thank you for your support of this program in previous years, and we look forward to working to build fiber networks in the years to come. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Ms. Clough? Good afternoon. My name is Stacy Clough. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on the appropriation of funds for broadband expansion. I'm, I'm here on behalf of Mille Lacs Energy Cooperative. MLEC is here today to support increasing the broadband grants available to 100 million, but would also like to see the grant terms changed to a 25% matching grant and the funding amount determined for a two-year period to help with planning of future projects. Malex Energy is an electric cooperative incorporated in 1939 and serving 13,000 members in rural Aiken, Mille Lacs, and a small part of Crow Wing County. Just as the Electric Cooperative Cooperation Act of 1937, drafted by the Rural Electric Administration, was necessary to provide financial assistance to extending rural electricity to, excuse me, to rural America, financial assistance is necessary to provide broadband to rural Minnesota. Without it, rural Minnesotans will not have the same access to educational opportunities, health care options, employment and economic development opportunities. Living without quality broadband significantly impacts people's lives and has a negative impact on economic development. Our communities need broadband to attract and retain people, grow business, educate our children, and adequately care for our seniors. MLEC sees the need of our rural members and has partnered up with CTC to fill this void in our service area. Mille Lacs is proud to say that we are a recent recipient of a border-to-border -border grant 
to extend fiber to the home to a portion of Aiken County. We thank the state of Minnesota for this exciting opportunity the grant will allow us to bring to our rural membership. However, we hope this is only part of a, only the start of a strong start of a strong relationship with CTC and the state to meet the broadband needs in our area of central Minnesota. MLEC is committed to investing in our members in our community. However, we are unable to undertake the level of debt and financial risk of extending fiber to all of our rural members without financial assistance. For rural areas like Aiken and Mille Lacs County, the grant program is extremely important. Our rural communities are begging for broadband, but the high cost of building out fiber is too much risk for small cooperatives to take on. Our rural service territory has less than eight members per mile, which makes a tough business case to building out a fiber network. Having a lower grant match and a multi-year funding platform gives cooperatives like MLEC the opportunity to reach more members over a larger area and develop, develop plans for future projects. Our unique partnership with CTC will allow us to serve this unmet need if the grant funding is available. This partnership with CTC was only, the, only possible because of the border to border funding and increasing the funding available and reducing the match will allow us to pursue additional projects together that neither cooperative would be able to cost justify on their own. Thank you for the opportunity to address broadband funding in rural Minnesota. I hope that history can repeat itself by cooperatives connecting rural Minnesotans to broadband just as they connected them to electricity 75 years ago. Ms. Clough, thank you for your testimony. Member, any questions uh, for these three testifiers? No? If not, thank you to all three of you for being here. Uh, next, we'll call up Mr. Peterson, Mr. Christensen, and then I'm not sure if Mr. Dorman or Mr. Hansen would like to testify again. They're certainly welcome to if they'd like. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and uh, proceed with your testimony. Good evening, or good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Uh, Gary Peterson, Executive Director of the Minnesota Association of Townships. And Mr. Chair, if it's okay, I would like to share my time uh, with uh, Nancy Hoffman and Bruce um, Hampton, who are with a project from uh, Sunrise Township, which was awarded a grant this uh, past uh, session, and I'd like to have them be able to update you in the committee if that is okay. Uh, that is. Uh, we have about 15 minutes left, so just keep the comments brief, but uh, welcome to the committee, and please uh, state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you. Um, with the Association of Minnesota Townships, we do represent 1,781 townships in the state, about 9,000 uh, township officers, and over 900,000 uh, residents. Uh, this is very, very important to us. I can't uh, 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 say that uh, uh, enough. Uh, this has been one of our top priorities the last few years, and continually our needs are uh, out there and we need to continue having uh, grant money put forward so we can continue to get broadband, not to, uh, not to just the uh, populated areas, but to that last uh, farmhouse in the um, uh, townships that we're so concerned about. Uh, a new round of grants would continue after uh, three years, would be fabulous. Uh, we certainly need this to be uh, going every year. Uh, the 35 million would again uh, put us in the same range as we were last year, which is uh, very acceptable to us. We certainly would like to see more. We'd like to get the projects done faster if we could. Um, but again, uh, we realize that, that uh, you have uh, budgetary restraints as well. The disparity between uh, our city counterparts and our rural township people is really what concerns me. When I go out into the rural areas, and again, I live in the rural area, I uh, live in Elmira Township in Olmsted County, even though I'm the executive director uh, for the state association. So I know what it is to have very slow and poor internet options. Uh, just to give you an example, very recently, I was going to order some uh, tickets online for the Billy Joel concert. I was on and, and watching my computer go like this. And again, I have satellite coverage, and they say that I have uh, between 3 and 15 uh, for speed. Uh, I would question that, but that's what they provide me. And I'm, as I'm watching it spin, I'm talking to my daughter who lives in Minneapolis. And she says, Dad, you want me to check and see if I can get the tickets for you? And I said, why not? And I mean, it was less than two seconds. 
literally. And she says, which seats would you like? And my computer's still going like this. Folks, that's the disadvantage that we're at. And it's not only the recreational areas, but we've got a lot of issues that are home-based businesses. I talked to a lady who moved to the Thief River Falls area in a township uh, just recently. She had to let her business go because she did not have the internet required to operate that home-based business in the rural area. We have agricultural needs. They're huge with all the technology coming into the uh, agricultural field. School children, they're given computers in school. We have stories of kids in the rural areas, their parents have to drive them to the McDonald's parking lot, to the coffee shop, to the school parking lot, to hook up and be able to do their homework at night. Medical, going online. Many of our uh, medical resources in the rural areas are going by the wayside. Medical online is gonna be bigger and bigger. We're not gonna be able to have it if we don't have true high-speed internet. Emergency services also need these. And again, it's a, certainly a concern in the rural areas. Our, our emergency <coughs> service is going to keep up. Um, also, I'd like to uh, say that uh, we would also support the A2 amendment today on the no challenge process. With that, Mr. Chair, I'd like to turn it over to Nancy Hoffman. And actually, Mr. Peterson, what I'm gonna do is, since we had Mr. Christensen on the list, I'm gonna let him buzz through his slideshow very quickly. We only have 10 minutes, and then I'll allow the final moments of the committee to get an update from, uh, from Ms. Hoffman. So Mr. Christensen, please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, my, for the record, my name is Brent Christensen. I'm the President and CEO of the Minnesota Telecom Alliance. We're a trade association that represents 45 uh, telecom, incumbent telecom providers, basically everybody but Frontier and Windstream throughout the state. I'm gonna buzz through these real quick, uh, but I wanna talk about some things on, and kind of build on what Senator Simonson started with and the kind of a little bit about the program and where, where it has been and, and where it's gonna go and why this border-to-border -border broadband uh, program is so important. It improves the business case for rural broadband. My members go to the last mile. We serve the very rural areas. Sometimes there's a one customer per mile, sometimes less. And these border-to-border -border broadband loans or grants have helped make the business case where a business case didn't otherwise exist. So if not for this program, broadband would not have gotten to the, to the uh, far reaches of the state. It promotes re, uh, meaningful collaboration. I just want to build upon the previous testifiers and the partnerships that have been formed out of this. We have some examples in the state of Minnesota of disasters that have happened when local government have tried to gone into the, the telecom business. But because of this broadband program and because of the Office of Broadband Development, we now have some success stories and we have some recipes for success and we have new ones that are popping up all the time. One thing that didn't get talked about is that this program, and to Senator Simonson's point about not tweaking this too much, this program funds grants that are scalable to 100 by 100. That means what we put in the ground today or what you provide state broadband grants for today are not the end of the story. Anything that gets state broadband grant money has to be scalable to 100 by 100. That's important. The other part is that it requires a match. So we're bringing in, and I'm gonna show you in the next slide, we're bringing in more money. So you're leveraging your state broadband dollars and you're getting a lot of bag for your buck. The other part is, and I'll show this on another slide, how regionally dispersed these grants are. They're going all over the state. You know, the governor called a few years ago for border to border broadband grant, or border to border broadband. This program is working and it's doing that. So here, just real quickly, Senator Simonson talked a little bit about it. I wanna build upon it. Over the last three years, there's been $65.58 million in grants awarded. That has leveraged an additional $81.6 million. Of that money, MTA member companies have been awarded $52.95 million in grants, and we've brought another $69.41 million to the table, either through private investment through our companies or partnerships that we have formed. So I speak from a position of experience here. These grants are working. This map is the one that the Office of Broadband Development hands out that just shows you, I won't go into any of the detail in this, but this shows you the grants that have been awarded over the last three. These are regionally dispersed. They're getting to every part of the state and they're continuing to, to work and do their job. 
But one thing that hasn't been talked about today is this, this program is more than just the grants. This program has to do with funding the Office of Broadband Development, which is critical. Even if the grants went away, even if you didn't have any grants, we still need funding for the Office of Broadband Development because they're the ones that facilitate conversations at the local level and at the state level, and they make sure that we don't trip over each other and start duplicating networks. The other part of this is they're in charge of the mapping. And we had uh, federal money for several years that has gone away, and we have to have continuing funding for broadband mapping if we're ever going to find out where we are or where we're going to go with broadband. We're never going to know if we hit border to border if we don't continue the mapping. Then there's the conversation about the dollar amount. And ultimately, that's up to you. I'm not about to, to tell, to get in between Senator Western and Senator Simonson on who's right and who's not. But there are some things that I ask that you think about when you decide what that dollar amount is. It needs to be enough to fund fully meaningful projects. Uh, two years ago, we had $10 million that was dispersed. That wasn't enough. We had a lot of projects that had to go back and reapply this past year. And a lot of my members went and reapplied for grants that got them this year that could have had them out last year. It needs to be predictable. So whatever dollar amount you send, I ask that you do it for the biennium. Let's get money in there for this year and for next year so that we can plan our, our projects accordingly. And finally, a couple years ago, there was a little error in the, in the grant program that required all of the projects to be done within one year. Well, with our construction cycle the way it is, we just can't do that. So we need, we need to make sure that we keep the language in statute that allows us to have a reasonable amount of time to complete these projects. The bigger the projects are, the longer they're going to take to complete. So it's going to take more than a year or two. So, and with that, that's as fast as I can go, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Christensen, nice job. Very well done. Um, Ms. Hoffman. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, uh, committee members. My name is Nancy Hoffman. I'm with the Chisago County HRA EDA. And um, I was asked to be here today to discuss our, our uh, township that just received a border-to-border -border grant. But to give you a little background, um, I wanted to say, you know, in our industrial parks, we have uh, businesses looking to locate expect us to have the infrastructure in place or they're not going to come. So for the most part, we're, we're very lucky that we have that in place. Um, I did put in front of you a survey that our county did, and I won't run through that for you. You can read that on your own. But there's other very good reasons that we need to have better broadband in our county for economic development reasons. Uh, once we started talking broadband, we had many, many uh, businesses, I always say, kind of coming out of the woods, literally, uh, asking for better broadband. We have a dome home. Uh, maker in our community that sells his dome homes internationally and he has to upload and download plans. He can't do that from his office in North Branch. Gas stations, wineries, um, drive-in restaurants have called because the broadband isn't reliable enough. They often cannot use their credit card. And so if they can't do that, they're, they're losing business. They're turning them away. Um, we have, uh, the reason we're here today basically is there's a third generation business, a manufacturing business in Sunrise Township with 40 plus employees that was paying more for his broadband than any other cost, including his labor. And so at that point, Mr. Hampton and, uh, and uh, Shane Stepp from Stepp Manufacturing came to my office and asked, what can we do? This started as a project for for one manufacturing business, and it turned into almost, what, what, three quarters of a township project. And if we have some time, if Mr. Hampton could expound Mr. on Mr. Hampton, that. we have about one minute. Oh, Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Good afternoon. My name is Bruce Hampton. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to address you folks, uh, Mr. Chair and committee members. I'll keep this very brief. Um, in our little township, the little corner of the world, we view the internet as a utility. Uh, unlike um, unlike uh, propane, I can bring that in. Unlike electricity, I can make my own water and sewer. I can take care of myself. I can't make my own internet. So this becomes a very difficult thing for us. And as a group of citizens, we used a, uh, a financing tool in the township at the township level called the Subordinate Service District, petitioned our, our township and volunteered our own money to fund a portion of this build out ourselves. Over 50% uh, over of our residents signed up for it. 
And on average, we're, uh, we're contributing approximately $1,000 per household out of our own money to say, please bring us high-speed internet. Very good. Thank you so much for the update. Thank you, testifiers. Uh, Senator Simonson, if you want to come up and give some closing comments. And as you make your way up, I just want to uh, recognize Ms. Dana McKenzie from the uh, Office of Broadband through DEED and want to thank her and her team for their work uh, on this issue as well. Senator Simonson. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I really don't have much more to add. As you can see, there's a lot of passion around the issue. There's certainly a lot of demand in greater Minnesota, um, and I think, uh, as I hope you get the sense, that there's not a tremendous appetite for, for large policy changes right now, uh, but there is certainly appetite for funding. So whatever it uh, ends up being that you can afford, uh, we would certainly appreciate your consideration as you move forward. Thank Senator you. Senator Simonson, thank you. Thank you for bringing the bill forward. It is a shared priority. I'm Certain that we won't get to the dollar amount that's uh, that's in your bill, but uh, when the when the budgets uh, when the targets are released, we'll certainly do our best to uh, provide funding. Uh, members, any other questions for Senator Simonson? If not, Senate File 234 will be laid over for possible inclusion. Members, with no other business, our next committee meeting is Wednesday. Uh, March 1st, and we have four bills on the agenda that is posted. And with no other business, uh, committee is adjourned.